Right, welcome to today's short hint chat as part of our guiding skills towards world class education series. Today we have Emma Hollis, who is an international educational consultant and a serving examiner. She specializes in curriculum assessment and the arts. Today we will be focusing on cultural capital, which is something that's been talked about a lot in recent months. Emma, we're, we're really delighted to have you with us today and giving us a chance to learn more about how cultural capital can have a significant impact on how well students make progress as they move through school. Before we get into the sort of nitty gritty detail, um, could you just start by explaining how you define cultural capital? Well, thank you, Malcolm, um, for inviting me to be part of this series. Uh, pleasure. And, um, um, it's really it's really nice to have the opportunity to talk to um, uh, the audience about cultural capital because it is a, a complex phrase and it's a contested one. Um, there, there are a number of definitions of culture if we just start there um, and we can go back to 19th century thinkers such as Matthew Arnold um, and then to sociologists of the 20th century such as Raymond Williams and uh, Pierre Bourdieu. Um, and essentially, I think when we're thinking about culture, we are thinking in it of, of the most broad um, sense of culture as belonging to a society. And, um, and, and often it gets confused as being synonymous with the arts. So yeah. we perhaps think about culture as being highbrow or exclusive, the domain of the privileged. And we might think, for example, of opera as being an example of culture. And in actual fact, um, sociologists um, like Raymond Williams uh, believe that culture is about the, um, the, the sense of identity which, which belongs to a people mm. from a particular community. And that if we want young people in particular to develop their cultural capital, that they need to go beyond their setting, not necessarily to access high art, but to access other experiences. Yeah. Yeah, no, that sounds great. And I think you're absolutely right. There's, um, there's, there's a general feeling that it, it, um, it is about the highbrow stuff. And when we look at the schools we have, uh, not only in the UK, but around the world, there are so many different cultures that the children come from, their the communities, their backgrounds, religion, and, and things like that, that they're bringing that into school with them. Now, would you call that the personal capital that they've gathered? I mean, how, how does that work from, from that ethnicity, religion type standpoint? Um, I think so. I think that is part of one's identity, isn't it? And yeah. um, sometimes people feel a strong affinity as a result of their, their family background with a particular aspect of their culture. Uh, and, and religion is a good example of that, that we may feel particularly strongly a member of a particular faith group um, as a result of our familial um, uh, upbringing. On the other hand, um, as young people um, develop um, into teenagers and beyond, um, we often find, don't we, that they begin to develop um, affiliations with other what we might call subcultures, mm -hmm. so um, groups of your other young people and even gangs. And so we might also think of culture as having a slightly less palatable dimension. And um, when we're thinking about cultural capital, I guess we're, we're trying to think uh, positively about the opportunities that we want young people to have in order to see beyond their immediate setting and to see um, and to seize opportunities which they may not have in their current um, home settings or communities. Yeah, and, 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 and absolutely. I, I mean, many of the schools that we've been, been into ourselves um, will celebrate um, that range of, of cultures that, that the children are bringing in, the students are bringing in. And I, th I think that the, the positivity of that is enormous. Uh, and if we're looking at preparing children, students for life after school, um, they are going to come in contact with many, many different cultures. And the idea of, of being able to respect those cultures is something that we need to be uh, sort of developing within the curriculum. Mm. Uh, I mean, what's, what's your, your sort of view on that? Well, of course, one of the things that has 
arisen as a result of the pandemic is in, an enhanced understanding of ourselves as citizens of the world because yeah. what, where we have technological advances and we are able to communicate without being in the same room um, we can begin to perhaps understand each other's um, uh, cultures better because we're we are um, uh, the, the world the, the back the international borders have been if you like um, uh, softened mm -hmm. and not necessarily removed and so if we then drill that down into schools whilst young people in remote learning might have been encountering their peers and not necessarily the world beyond actually the the advantages that have been brought to us through digital technology mean that we can begin to encounter cultures way beyond our own through technology so in the context of my experiences in school, um, it has tended to be the case that when leaders are thinking about planning to develop people's cultural capital, they're thinking about the enrichment program. Mm. They're thinking perhaps about um, those trips and visits to theatres and galleries, etc. And again, we come back down to that um, synonym between the arts and culture. And actually, it, it, it doesn't, although that's important, clearly, and I would say that as an arts educator, um, that there's more to it than that. It is also about that world beyond your own, which, which has been brought into focus for us through the power of technology, particularly in this last year. Um, I mean, one of the important things I think, what, which we would all agree, um, characterizes our experiences with of different cultures is food. So mm. sometimes in, in, in the sense of the food technology element of the, of the curriculum or food and nutrition, um, we, we can be focusing on the technical skills of learning how to cook or of the importance of understanding a balanced diet. But actually, it's also about um, utilising the opportunities to think about food from other cultures. So I think there, are, there should be opportunities in every area of the curriculum to think about developing people's cultural mm -hmm. awareness, which will also develop their cultural capital. Yeah, absolutely. I probably might even go a bit further than that. And going back to the celebration of personal culture is because everybody is coming with a different start point they may even come from the same group but have a different start point yeah. and therefore have a different contribution to to their learning experience and i think what um, may concern me at times is the fact that that's not taken into account so that if we're always dictating um to the students this is how you should learn rather than saying well what is your start point and celebrating what that is um then you're not actually meeting the the particular needs mm. and if we know if we don't meet the needs or respect them as as individuals regardless of their culture um then they will start to disengage Mm. So uh, I'm just wondering what 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 you feel about how how we might celebrate all of these cultures, respect the individuals, so that that the the, the curriculum becomes more personalised and allows them to bring that culture into the work they're doing, mm. and therefore able to celebrate that through a wide range of different different subject areas. And it, yeah. if they're able to do that, would that enable them to engage more? Well, I think there are three elements to good practice in this area that I've um, that I've encountered. The first one is is that the curriculum needs to be investigated um, uh, to identify across all subject areas where those opportunities are to enable people, young people, to think about their identity and also the explore the world beyond. So in every subject, there should be that kind of mapping activity going on which can then be brought together um, into um, to produce a, a very often a visual map of where those opportunities are in, in the curriculum. Then the second aspect to it is, is that wider curriculum, is, is, is identifying those opportunities to go outside the setting, to go on, but um, ideally multidisciplinary field trips, you know, trips which, which include opportunities to look at, um, uh, you know, to use geography, history, art, to look at the local landscape, to, to paint it, to draw it, to investigate it, to, um, you know, use maths and science to interrogate it. 
So those opportunities which take us outside of our, our doorstep and perhaps internationally. Um, so organisations like World Challenge, for example, have always played a role here mm. in facil facilitating those opportunities. And then the third aspect is documenting those experiences. Sometimes schools have um, initiatives which have their own inbuilt documentation, like Duke of Edinburgh Award, for example, in the UK or World Challenge. Um, but um, schools are increasingly, in my experience, also creating, if you like, um, portfolios to help pupils to document their experiences, which, which generate cultural capital, which, which build their vocabulary, which, which provide them with those opportunities to go beyond their settings. So thinking of a school that I've recently been working with, they've developed a baccalaureate scheme Mm -hmm. Not to be confused with the uh, qualification, the IB, where at the end of year eight, they provide students the opportunity to graduate with a with a, a H back because the school um, a begin is a H word. Um, and that is accompanied that graduation by a really quite extensive um, portfolio of evidence of things they've done. Um, and I think where primary schools have been quite good at that in the past, it's now kind of coming into the fore in secondary schools as they attempt to do this mapping. Mm. So I think the three things have to go together. There's the strategic element of planning um, opportunities, identifying them and planning them. Then there's the wider curriculum and then there's that documentation. Um, absolutely right. And I'm just wondering where the students themselves can take a part in that. So if, if at the curriculum design stage, even um, where if it's left to the staff of the school, they may not understand all the different levels of cultural capital coming into the school with the with the students. Just wondering how, how maybe that, that we can encapsulate that, what the students are bringing with them and for them to be able to explain to the school um, how the curriculum can be adapted or changed or acknowledge the, where they are coming from and how they can then contribute to what you're talking about is that big understanding of a wide range of cultures that they're experiencing in school but if they're not given the opportunity mm. to share that in in their learning mm. then maybe it's a, a big missed opportunity absolutely and i think um that's where the, the strategic leadership of um, developing a cultural infrastructure for the school is so important because ideally it needs to link with um, opportunities for democratic people voice. So yeah. it might be that you have some cultural champions in the school, for example, people cultural champions who sit on the school parliament or the school council. Yeah. It might be that, again, age and stage appropriate. It might be that you have arts champions who particularly focus on that side of enrichment, sports champions, and that those people come together into a little separate panel. Yeah. So I think there have to be mechanisms which are built into the strategic planning to enable um, leaders and staff to gather people feedback so the development for example of that portfolio um was very much um informed by people voice yeah. and and that's why they came up with the graduation ceremony because people wanted an end point yeah and and what about the parents voice within that as well is that something that that they managed to grab yeah and, well parents are invited to the graduation i mean they book a venue and parents have a ticket and it's you know it's all they have little they have gowns i mean that's just one example but i think it is a really powerful example because it really promotes self-esteem for that school within their community yeah Okay, we're coming out of time now, which is a shame because we could talk about this all day, I'm sure. Um, do you think, can you think of one nugget that you would say, take this away with you today and, um, and see whether that can have an impact in what you're doing in school? Yeah, I mean, I would say that the, the starting point for me is always that mapping exercise that um, it, it's it's a really um, positive way of generating staff ownership as well of, 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 of um, identifying those opportunities, you know, to perhaps um, come up with a, um, a short template that staff can populate and subject leaders can populate which which identifies some opportunities and then acts as a kind of sounding board for staff meetings where they can then look at their schemes of work and think about where those opportunities sit. And then we could bring that all together then at the centre. So I think starting there and then moving on from there is, is a really important way of strategically leading this kind of work. 
Brilliant, lovely. Thanks so, so much, Emma. Um, too short a time to, to have a chat about this, but thanks so, so much for sort of pulling it all together and uh, giving us a better understanding of, of what it's all about. So really appreciate your time uh, and wish you well. Thanks for having me. Take care. Bye-bye.